lady by the name of Laura Cooper in Englewood, Colorado, uh, told a, a powerful story. Uh, she was five years old and she was in uh, preschool. And one day when preschool got out, she ran out to her car. Uh, mom was waiting for her with her little three-year-old sister and, and the baby. And she jumped in and she says, Mom, guess what? Next week we're going to have a food festival. And each one of us are supposed to bring something. And I'm supposed to bring cookies. And she noticed that her mom wasn't quite as enthused about the food festival as she was. And she finally asked her mom, she says, is that okay, mom? And mom said, well, dear, we don't have any cookie dough. And if we're going to make cookies, we're going to have to get the ingredients for it. And we don't have the, the money in our budget right now for ingredients for, for cookie dough. Oh, well, what are we going to do, Mom? And her mom said, dear, we're going to pray. So with that, little Laura and her little three-year-old sister, and I can just picture them bowing their heads and, dear God, please get us this cookie dough for the food festival. And with that, they let it go. And they went home and uh, two days later, they had all their coloring projects out on the kitchen table and they were coloring away. And uh, there was a knock at the door. And who could that be? And they turned around and it was their neighbor from across the street. Uh, it was highly unusual that she would be over. She had a little girl too, but she was several years older than Laura and they didn't play together or anything. And this woman kind of tended to stay by herself. She didn't get out much and interact with the neighbors and thought it was kind of unusual that there she was. But in her arms, she had two big tubs and she said, I was just wondering, um, I need to make room in my refrigerator and could you possibly use these two big tubs of chocolate chip cookie dough? <laughs> and so the little girl, yay, we got our cookie dough. God brought us the cookie dough. This is awesome. And... Uh, these years later, Laura Cooper in Englewood, Colorado wrote, Now in my 20s, I still remember that potluck. Some might say that it was the moment that I discovered my family was poor. It's actually when I discovered how rich we were. Well, good morning. Good morning. Thank you for coming out today. A little cloudy, but uh, we know that behind those clouds, the sun is indeed shining. So uh, thank you for being here and welcome to the Alaska Center for Spiritual Living. And welcome to those of you who are watching on YouTube. I'd love to have you as well. Welcome. Thank you for being here. The title of my talk today is The Power of Prayer. My three major points. One, prayer is how we remind ourselves of a spiritual truth. Number two, there is no wrong way to pray. And number three, the law cannot do for us that which we are unwilling to do for ourselves. First of all, prayer is how we remind ourselves of a spiritual truth. And I want to start off a little bit of terminology here. Within our movement, you know, we follow the teachings of a guy by the name of Ernest Holmes. He wrote back in the uh, 20s, almost 100 years ago. Um, in fact, some of his writing is 100 years uh, old. Um, and he used the term of the day treatment. And that was uh, in response to the fact that we were doing prayers for others. And in those days, that was considered a form of treatment. Not much different than what we do. we'd look at physical therapy today or, or medical treatment. Uh, so we use the term treatment or, or spiritual mind treatment because we do it within our own mind, within our own consciousness. But what it is, and perhaps a little bit more accurate modern vernacular, is affirmative prayer. We believe in praying affirmatively. Ernest Holmes once said, we have nothing new. We simply have a new approach to an old truth, a more intelligent, a more systematic way of consciously arriving at faith. 
And we, we don't have anything new on this. It's just really a little bit more organized way of getting ourselves to the awareness of our own divinity that we, are, that we have within us that divine spark. What prayer is not? Prayer is not an attempt to persuade God or the universe to do for us that which we feel that we are incapable of doing. We're not trying to persuade the big guy up there to do something for us. We're trying to open ourselves up to the possibility of a better way of being, a better way that, of doing things. I was going to use a, a quote that something that I had heard. It just it came to me. It was that uh, prayer is the last refuge of the scoundrel. Uh, you know, I better check that out before I just whip that out. And it was interesting because what I found is the the original phrase was not prayer. It was patriotism is the last refuge of the scoundrel. And who actually said prayer is the last refuge of the scoundrel happened to be Lisa Simpson. When she was talking about Bart while he was praying over a test he had to take. And I thought, you know, I, we can do a little bit better uh, for a philosophical base than the Simpsons. Um, The Last Refuge of the Scoundrel. It was actually said by Samuel Johnson in 1775. Prayer does not change the mind of God. It changes the mind of the one praying. And that's what it's all about. Holmes used to talk about the fire and the technique. And generally in there what he was talking about is uh, the fire being your feelings. The fire being your faith that your prayer would be answered. That, that this is actually a done deal. That it's already done. That absolute faith and it is a fire. And then the technique is what you know has morphed over the years. Today we're using a five step process in, in prayer. Um, I don't know. Now I can see there are some practitioner students out there that are saying, well then why is he so insistent we have five steps in our prayers? <laughs> Well, because I get to, that's why. But there has to be some objective way to evaluate it, and that's what we do. But I don't think it really... It's all about you. It's all about what you believe and what you think. Ernest Holmes talked about praying incessantly in Living the Science of Mind. He wrote, Between prayers, try to keep your mind poised in such a way that you do not contradict what you have said in your treatment. Keep your mind open at all times to a divine influx of new inspiration, new power, and a new life. This was uh, illustrated in, a, in another story. A lady by the name of Roberta Mesner. Uh, she's a nurse. Uh, works at a health uh, uh, medical center in Huntington, West Virginia. Uh, her area of responsibilities in this uh, medical facility is infection control. Um, she went had to make sure that there was no infection that spread throughout the, the medical facility. Um, they had recently gotten some new software that was able to analyze all of the medical records of all of the uh, patients and give an alert to somebody who might be susceptible to some type of uh, infection that could be spread throughout the hospital. And it was good that they got this new software because they uh, were faced with an infection of, and I forgot to ask Judy Wolf, but this is as close as I can be, Acinetobacter baumani. <laughs> Oh, I got a good laugh out her. I must have really been out of whack. <laughs> what it is is it's a really nasty bacteria that uh, is highly resistant to any type of antibiotic. Boy, and that's the one thing they didn't want in their, in their uh, medical facility was this nasty bacteria that could easily be spread. She had a, uh, a nurse a student, a fellow by the name of Julius, 
uh, and she really liked Julius, and he was on rotation. He happened to be in her department at that time. One thing about Julius is he was always praying. Julius prayed before he did everything. She swore if he went to wash his hands, he'd wash his hands. Before he prayed, he would wash to make sure that he got everything clean. Julius prayed about everything. Well, he came to her and he said, I, I really don't get how all this works. How can I tell if somebody is susceptible to an infection by looking at their medical chart? And she said, well, here, let me show you. We'll just take any medical chart in here at random and we'll look it up. And he said, well, would you mind if we prayed first? Yes, Julius, let's pray first. And Julius's prayer was simple. And he just said, mm. he said, I know that I'm new at this, God, and I'm just learning. But I know that, God, you have infinite intelligence. And we just tap into that now. And we just tap into that infinite intelligence. Amen. And she said, amen, let's do this. So she just plucked into her uh, database and pulled out one particular patient's file. And she pulled it up. And she says, okay, so you can see right here, uh, this person is susceptible to infection. They have two uh, ports for you know medication to be coming in. Those are you know possible entries of infection into the body and whatnot. And as she looked down the file, there in front of her said Sinatobacter bumani, the very thing that they were trying to do. And it had escaped all of their detection. It had got through the software. It had done everything. But out of the hundreds and hundreds of medical records that she had, she could have picked anyone, and she picked the one that got through. The one that got through. And it was traced to a, a new employee that had misunderstood her uh, assignment and her direction, what she was supposed to do for her job. And she made a mistake and it got through. It was easily corrected. That was the only case of it that came through. The software had caught everything else. But what are the chances out of hundreds and hundreds of medical records for her to pick that one? Maybe. It's because of the infinite intelligence directed her to pick that. Maybe Julius's prayer was pretty effective. Point number two, there is no wrong way to pray. There, you know, no individual is better than any others. I know some of the practitioners can, boy, they can get up and pray up a storm. Boy, hey, the words just flow. You know, they've really got this down. You know, I don't personally believe that the divine creative force um, requires beautiful poetry like prayers. I think that the divine creative force taps into who we are, what's in our heart, and responds right there. I don't think that any person or any thing is better than any other in terms of prayer. It certainly doesn't have to be flowery. You must believe in the prayer. And the key thing, and it's said in the Christian Bible, it's said in the Hebrew Scriptures, it's been repeated many, many times, it is done unto you as you believe. Out of our sacred reading this morning, Ernest Holmes said, said Enter into a feeling of assurance that comes from a consciousness of the divine presence in, around, and through you. Again, enter into a feeling of assurance that comes from a consciousness of the divine presence in, around, and through you. Third point is the law cannot do for us that which we are unwilling to do for ourselves. We've got to do what, our can, what we can. One of the songs we sing, you know, do what we can with what we have. We have to make the attempt. We have to give God the chance. Reverend Rachel Hollander, one of her favorite stories is about the uh, guy that uh, is faced with a flood, you know, and um, the rains are coming down and the disaster people are going house to house, notification, evacuation. You need to evacuate now. The flood, there's going to be a flood. And he says, oh, no, he says, God will save me. And sure enough, it rained and rained and the floodwaters came up and now his house is sitting there and he's walking around the first floor up to about his knees and a boat pulls up out front. You know, we're here to rescue you. Anybody that's still left here, we've got a boat we can get you. No, 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 he says, God will save me. 
Well, sure enough, you know, a few hours later, he's up on the roof of his house. And all that's there is the peak of the roof, and he's up there. Pop, 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 comes the helicopter, comes down. They drop down the ladder. He says, no, no. He says, God will save me. And sure enough, the water went up, and he drowned. And he ended up at the pearly gates, and he got up there to St. Peter, and he says, well, St. Peter, I thought God was going to save me. And St. Peter says, he sent you the early warning. He sent a boat and he sent a helicopter. What more do you think he needs to do? <laughs> and that's what we kind of have to do. You know, we have to be aware that that divine current can help us in an infinite number of ways and we need to be available to it. We have to do our part. Final story, a lady by the name of Patricia McAdams, Sun City Center in Florida, talked about the time a few years earlier her husband came home from work and he was really excited. He threw his, his coat and his briefcase down next to the organ that was tucked away in the corner of their house and he says, guess what? I got the fellowship. And he had been awarded a doctoral uh, fellowship at the university. Uh, it was really a big deal. It would fast track his career. It would help them in so, so many ways. And the flip side of that coin is he would have to quit his job. And they really depended on his income. She was a stay-at-home mom. She had, you know, three little ones. Um, they were really faced with, with a problem. Plus, they really needed some life insurance. They had no life insurance. And she had been looking around, and she'd made a few phone calls on life insurance, and there were no way that they could afford life insurance, particularly if you know, he had to quit his job and take this fellowship. But what an opportunity for him to get his doctorate. So she didn't know what to do. They sat down on the couch after dinner, and they... They talked and he didn't know what to do. And so she just silently went into prayer. And she says, God, this is bigger than me. This is more than I can do. You need to step in and help me now. And with that, ding dong, somebody at the door. They went to the door and she opened and there was a man in a suit. and He was a life insurance salesman. And before she explained to him, there's no way they could possibly afford life insurance. He she did invite him in and he looked around and he had an organ over there? Yes. Do you play? Well, yes, I do. Oh, would you by any chance be interested? Our church is looking for a new organist and we've been, you know, looking all over for an organist and we haven't been able to find one. Would you be willing to, you know, audition for it? And she thought for a minute, well, you know, she'd been playing the organ since she was 10, but she never thought of it as a way to make a living or earn any money. Well, sure, she said, I'll give it a try. She had one short tryout and was hired on the spot to a full-time position as the organist for this uh, uh, church. The new position uh, was just a very short distance away, a few uh, blocks away from her parents' house who could watch the kids while she was at work. So she wouldn't be paying daycare costs. The church, while it didn't pay a lot, with his stipend, it allowed them to have enough to keep their house, to be able to put a bean on the table, to do everything they needed to do, and with just a little bit left over for a life insurance policy. The conclusion, what I want you to take away today. There are some themes to some of this. In the cookie dough story, Laura Cooper and her sister had total faith in the outcome. They didn't doubt for a minute that God was going to get them the cookie dough. They didn't have any limits or restrictions. It didn't have to be what kind of cookie dough it was. They, didn't have they were just happy with cookie dough. The organist, Patricia McAdams, the divine responded immediately. Ding dong. She hadn't finished her prayer hardly. And it was answered. Once again, she had no strings attached. She was just open for divine help. And she got a job. 
And then in the divine discovery, discovering the, you know, the accidental revealing of the, the, of the virus and being able to get the patient isolated. Julius always prayed and he was open to the highest good. So here's the takeaway. Prayer is a tool. The more we practice it, the better we get at convincing ourselves of the truth. The more convinced we are, the more faith we have. When we practice regularly, it becomes a power tool. The key to prayer has less to do with words and more to do with feelings and everything to do with convincing ourselves to have more and more faith in the good of the universe and the potential of our own divinity. And so it is with that awareness of our own divinity that I invite my colleagues the practitioners to join me in holding our congregation in love and light and knowing that as we face the challenges of this earthly plane that behind these temporary challenges there is a spiritual truth that is the highest good for each and every one of us we don't deny circumstances we don't deny that there is disease but we do know that where there is disease that disease is temporary and the thing that is permanent is that there is an intelligence within each and every one of us at the cellular level at the atomic level even at the subatomic level that knows what is right for each and every one of us a perfect health that directs cells how to divide for our perfect health and it is that intelligence that we call upon and I speak my word for those who are faced with challenges of money and prosperity and abundance yes conditions exist where we do not have enough but the truth is the capital T truth is we live in a universe that is so abundant we can't begin to count the grains of sand on a beach. We can't count the number of salmon in the river. We can't count the number of stars in the sky. They are all conspiring for our good here and now. We open ourselves up to that abundance, that prosperity. And finally, I speak my word for those who are feeling a sense of separation, a sense of being apart. It makes no difference these are family relationships work relationships romantic relationships the truth that is behind that is each and every one of us are divine children of the Most High each and every one of us are infused with God's love so as we live and move and have our being it is that God's love that we call forth in every relationship we set aside dif differences we set aside the appearance of separation and we embrace our oneness. We embrace that which is true. We embrace the very love of God. And so we just give thanks. We give thanks for our awareness of prosperity and abundance in our lives. We give thanks for health and vitality. We give thanks for the love of God. And I release these words to the working of a law that always, always says yes. And so it is.